Marvelous hello, friends and loved ones. Did you know that this is my 100th video? I mean, technically it's like my 270 something video. But if you don't count the Demonic Compendium and Trinity Soul Tuesdays and my Mega 10 ranking videos and all those news reactions and basically just any other video I've done that I decided doesn't count for whatever reason, then yes, this is my 100th video. And I think that's pretty special. I had quite a bit of a debate over what my 100th video should be about. I've already talked about my favorite video game ever, twice. I've talked about most of my favorite Mega Ten titles already, plus I just did the answer. But then I remembered how much I love Pokémon, and how even though it's one of my favorite series of all time, and I have talked about it on this channel before with spin-offs or ROM hacks, I've never really talked about what I consider my favorite mainline entry in the series. And I'm arguably still not because this is another ROM hack video. Today I'm going to be playing Pokemon Perfect Crystal Version. This isn't the ROM hack, this is just a copy of actual Crystal Version. Pokemon Perfect Crystal is a ROM hack of Crystal version that was released in 2018 by Super Eggs, and is essentially designed to be an updated and improved version of Crystal, specifically with the solo player in mind. Now, just to clarify, at its core, this is still Crystal version. They didn't add the fairy type, there's no physical special split, and even when the game got updates in more recent years, there's no GBC-style sprite of Galarian Corsola for me to catch in the game. The main changes are now that every family of Pokémon is in some way catchable, and some Pokémon appear in new areas. Pokémon that evolve via trade now evolve with stones, TMs are reusable, and certain event or mystery gift exclusive items are available in the main game. Oh yeah, and we get running shoes, which honestly, that alone is enough to recommend this ROM hack. Zoom. But since this is a special occasion, my 100th main video and all, I wanted to do something I've been wanting to do on this channel for a long time. I am going to be sharing my Pokémon Perfect Crystal Adventure, but this time... It's a Nuzlocke. For any of you that may not be familiar with the concept of a Nuzlocke, it is a self-imposed challenge that many players do to try and make Pokémon games a little more exciting. The main rules are that you can only catch the very first Pokémon you encounter in a new area, and if you fail to do so, you just don't get a Pokémon in that spot. If a Pokémon faints for any reason, it is considered dead and you must release it or, in my case, put it into a special PC box to remind me of my failures. And you have to nickname all your Pokémon so that you're more emotionally attached to them. There are additional house rules like not using items or changing battles to set, but I decided to go with the basic rules for this playthrough. So I boot up the game and once again choose to play as a girl, which is fitting since Crystal was the first game where that was an option, and this time I'm the delightfully perky Dristal. I head to Professor Elm's laboratory, and he wants me to do him a favor, so he gives me a totodile that I named Bitey. After visiting Mr. Pokemon and getting a Pokedex from Oak, I battle a red-headed jerk who turned out to be named Jilver. It's only after I go through all this that my Nuzlocke can truly begin, since now I actually have Pokeballs. In the early routes of the game, I catch Cratface the Rattata and Tomato the Spinarak. Why tomato? Because it starts small and green, it becomes big and red, and I do not want to find one in my salad. I also catch Cinnabon the Poliwag, which I probably would have been happier about if I didn't already have a water type. Aside from having the super handy run option, I don't really feel the true magic of perfect crystal until I arrive in Violet City and decide to catch something on Route 36, where I encounter a Houndour! Oh, she is such a good girl, and I name her bark and she's my favorite, and I'm gonna be the saddest if she dies. Yes, I am. Thanks to bark the Sprout Tower is a total joke, so I go to fight Faulkner, and I realize that another change they made here was all the gym leader's Pokémon are the levels that they were in Heart Gold Soul Silver, rather than the original game. So, that's good to know. Alright, so after I meet Faulkner, this next part may take a little bit of explaining. 
I took special care not to encounter any wild Pokemon on Route 32. As you can see, I'm playing at night because I'm an adult with a full-time job, and I figured my odds of actually catching a Mary were total crap. But I did battle Fisherman Ralph and got his phone number, so hopefully I'm going to come back here later and catch myself a Quillfish. As I made my way through the Onion Cave, I caught an Onyx named Nope Rope, who I figured may be a handy backup if Bugsy's Gym ends up being too much for Barkbecue to handle on her own. Once I make it to Azalea Town, I help get rid of the rockets in Slowpoke's well, and sadly I don't catch a Slowpoke because of stupid Zubat, but I don't run into any other problems, and thanks to Barkbecue and Nope Rope, Bugsy winds up not being any sort of problem. Alright, so in the Ilex Forest, I'm gonna help this guy catch this Farfetch'd. So we need to be very, very quiet. Heck yeah! Quillfish time! Now, unfortunately, at this point of the game, I only have an old rod, so even with the swarm, the odds of me finding a quillfish are not very- Welcome to the team, foo guy! Oh yeah, and I also got the TM for headbutt and caught a Heracross in Azalea Town thanks to a helpful guide that tells you which trees to headbutt based on the last digit of your trainer ID. Her name, Big Mac. While Heracross sounds exciting, I do occasionally have to remember, this is Gen 2, where this bug fighting type does not learn a decent fighting or bug move until it's in its 40s. Alright, so next up I get to Goldenrod City and it's time for the big one. The Pokemon that has destroyed so many childhoods and the obliterator of Nuzlocke's... Whitney's Miltank. So yeah, remember how I mentioned that trade Pokemon evolve with stones now? Well, see, you can buy those stones in Goldenrod, so it's time for Nope Rope to upgrade to the Pain Chain. And yeah, when you have a Steelix, that Miltank is not all that scary. I was fine. Unfortunately, you know who wasn't fine? While I was trying to train Bitey to evolve, our team suffered its first loss. I mean, don't worry, it wasn't Bitey, but Fire Breather Walt's Magmar totally killed Cratface. Which probably would have bothered me more if I didn't catch a much better normal type, Malkers the Miltank, out on Route 39. In Ecruteak City, which, by the way, is like my favorite city in all of Pokémon, Barkbecue evolves into Houndoom while I'm fighting the Kimono Girls, and I have a rematch against Jilver in the Burn Tower where I met Suicune. It also turns out that having a Houndoom makes Morty... really easy, so he can suck it. I end up getting a little training done in Olivine's Lighthouse and talk to Jasmine about needing to go to Cianwood to get the special medicine. Now, admittedly, this is the part of the game where I did start to get a little worried. I know the next gym leader is Chuck, and between Barkbecue, Pain Chain, and Malkers, half of my team is weak against fighting types. And while Big Mac and Fugai resist fighting, they don't really have anything all that helpful offensively. So, I decide to hopefully not kill any birds with a stone and backtrack through Onion Cave. Yes, I know it's Union, shut up to the Ruins of Alf area and catch myself a Natu. I know it evolves pretty quickly into Zatu, and hopefully the Psychic Flying type will give me an advantage. Unfortunately, much like Heracross, this is Gen 2 Zatu, who only has Peck and doesn't learn a single decent damage Psychic move until level 65. However, I'm hoping that me giving it the most incredibly awesome nickname in the history of forever will give me an advantage in this fight. And thanks to some stat lowering from Big Mac, I'm thrilled to say that Totemly Spy was able to defeat Chuck's Polyrath for me. However, it was not a perfect victory. See, in order to get that clean switch to Totemly Spy, I did have to sacrifice a beloved member of our team. R.I.P. T. The Unknown, whom I never bothered to mention before now. So I get the medicine, Totemly Spy flies me back to Olivine, and I fight Jasmine in what basically becomes a Steelix vs. Steelix match. Pain Chain is admittedly a lower level, but unlike Jasmine's Steelix, has Dig, so is actually able to do some super effective damage. It does take some time because there is some high defense here, but I claim my 6th gym badge. 
After that, nothing too exciting really happens as I make my way to the Lake of Rage and catch Shiracha, the Red Gyarados, before helping Lance clear out the Team Rocket members in Mahogany Town. Mulkers and Fugai help me take down Price, and I get my seventh gym badge. <sighs> Man, seven badges in and I have not lost a single Pokémon that I actually care about. Nothing could ruin this- Oh, one second. Hello? What's going on at the radio tower? So I head back to Goldenrod, and I am just destroying Rocket Grunts left and right. I take out the admin on the top floor, I even slap Jilver around without a sweat. I am on top of the world! Is what every Nuzlocker says when they're getting just a little bit too cocky. So I make it to the last admin's last Pokémon throughout this whole Team Rocket takedown, and look, maybe I should have trained him a little more, maybe I should have just stuck with Pain Chain, but... An unfortunate critical hit took the life of Fugai. It was a one-hit KO. At that moment, I thought about saying nuts to the Nuzlocke and just finishing the game with Fugai anyway, but... He wouldn't have wanted that. He would have wanted to stay dead. But thankfully, even with Fugai gone, there's another water type that's been with us from practically the beginning. A noble, powerful, wonderful water type that you all probably thought I forgot about. So I take Cinnabon the Poliwag out of the daycare center, which is awesome because they leveled him up to like his mid-30s. I evolve him into Poliwhirl, and since I'm in Goldenrod anyway, I may as well buy myself a Moonstone and welcome Cinnabon the Politoed to my team. I was looking forward to maybe catching an ice type in the ice path, but it was a deli bird and I accidentally killed it. Now, full confession, after losing Fugai, I was terrified to fight Claire. That Kingdra had me far more worried than Whitney's stupid Miltank, who was nowhere near as awesome as my Miltank. Remember, this is Gen 2, when Kingdra's only weakness is Dragon because Fairy doesn't exist yet. The thing also has water moves that'll just obliterate Bark, Baku, and Pain Chain. So I start grinding, because I've got a plan. A plan that I couldn't have done if not for Fugai's sacrifice. Fugai, if you can hear me from that daycare center toilet that I tried to flush you down and you got stuck, this one's for you. And now we play the waiting game. And with that, plus a dumb side quest through the Dragon Den, I have all eight Johto badges and I am ready to take on the Elite Four. I head back to New Bark Town and step into Kanto for the very first time. After making my way through a route where a bunch of Ace Trainers are all really into having Starmie for some reason, I take on Victory Road. I get that TM for Earthquake and give it to Pain Chain and once again show Jilver who's boss. Now, I'm ready to take on the Elite Four. So first up is Will, and he is super easy. Bark Baku takes out nearly all of his Pokémon with a single hit. I was admittedly a little worried about Slowbro, because I know it has really high defenses, but then I remembered it doesn't actually have any water moves, so it's pretty easy as well. Koga goes down just as easily with a combination of Bark Baku and Pain Chain. Admittedly, the fight against his Crobat was weirdly long, but definitely not difficult. But then it came time for Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno. Can I still make that joke? Is that still funny? Was it ever? I was definitely worried about losing a Pokemon here. Half my team is still weak against fighting. His Hitmonchan has moves that are super effective against every member of my team, and Totemly Spy is still 15 levels away from learning Psychic. Plus, most of his Pokémon have countermeasures against flying types. I take out a few of his Pokémon without too much issue, but it's that Machamp I know is gonna give me some problems. Especially when it decides to- Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> Do that! <laughs> totally spy! That was totally close. <laughs> but I pull off the win without losing a single Pokémon. 
Karen's Umbreon admittedly got kind of annoying with it using sand attacks and everything, but after that, the rest of her team was basically a bunch of pushovers compared to Bruno. I was not sweating this fight at all. And that means the only fight that's left is the champion. The Dragon Master himself, Lance. Now, I knew I could handle it if I just stayed calm, cool, and collected. Cinnabon has Ice Punch, so that helped a lot against some of his Dragonites, who are really into the paralyze you and then try to make you flinch with Twister combo. And then, his very last Pokémon, Aerodactyl, uses Hyper Beam, gets a crit, and fails to finish me off, sucker! And with one final surf, it was over. Dristal and her team had become champions. Cinnabon, Barkbecue, Pain Chain, Big Mac, Malkers, and Totemly Spy. We did it. And yeah, I know this is Gen 2, so I could continue to go through the Kanto region, battle through the gyms there, catch a few new Pokemon just in case, get that freaking TM for Psychic so Totemly Spy can be a lot more useful, and eventually take on Red, but I think I want to end this Nuzlocke journey here, and not just because in this ROM hack, Red's team is all level 100, and I want to avoid the pain of experiencing everyone's death all at once. And with that, I consider my time with Pokémon Perfect Crystal to be a success. We made a lot of good friends, lost a few along the way, and hopefully had a few laughs. I want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for helping me get to 100 videos. Whether I was covering games, lists, or my top 10 titles of a given year, it's always been a lot of fun. Now, here we are, almost 8 years and tantalizingly close to 10,000 subscribers later, and I am still having fun, and I appreciate you all for watching my content. So, here's what I want you to do. In the comments below, please share your favorite memory of the past 100 videos. Was there a favorite joke or video that stuck with you? What content are you still hoping I do in the future? I want to thank you all again for watching, and until next time, take care. everyone, thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, be sure to click like, but if you really liked it, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos. Extra special thanks to all my friends and loved ones over on Patreon, which you can pledge to today to see your own name in these ending credits. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, take care.